All right, welcome. Welcome everybody for the uh, April 2022 edition of Faro Shared, joint meetup iOS Soho and DC iOS. It's been a while. Uh, I think we haven't met unfortunately this year, but we're catching up and very, very excited to be back uh, for yet another great evening on, of learning. Tonight, uh, as you can see on this slide, we're gonna be learning about two great topics. Uh, Vincent, who is joining us from far away from France, it's very late for him. Thank you very much for being here. He's gonna to talk to us about Swift UI and async await, uh, how does it work? Um, and Scott uh, will talk to us and explain uh, how to deal with, uh, I guess, Xcode project generation. Uh, yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna just, oh, wait, okay. Welcome, slide. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, as you had just mentioned, this is a co-organized meetup, uh, just a couple of words on our respective meetups. IOSO is a New York based meetup. We've been around for a few years. We used to do in-person events and for the past two years, we've been doing mostly online co-organized events with uh, DC iOS, uh, we are very excited to be going back in person very soon, uh, more on that at the end of the meetup. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to pass it to Scott quickly for to introduce uh, DC iOS. Hi, so my name is Scott. I'm one of the two co-organizers for DC iOS. We've been around for probably a little over two years. We actually were relatively new by the time we had to, you know, start going virtual for everything. We probably only had about three or four meetups before that time point, but uh, as based on our name, we're based in the DC area, mostly in Northern Virginia, though uh, hopefully as we start getting back to going in person, we can find some new locations in the area that we can present at. Usually we just presented at Capital One as one of our sponsors, but hopefully we can find some new locations and maybe get back to some uh, in-person meetups in the summer as well. Awesome, thanks Scott. Um, well, the rest is, uh, as you can see, you're muted for now. We'll have a networking session at the end of the meetup and you'll be able to unmute yourself and, and uh, hang out in breakout rooms. Uh, and for those of you who might have to leave early or want to share the recording um, later on or review, revisit the video, uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So I already covered that. Uh, we have two great talks tonight. And uh, at the end of both, we have a QA and a session. But at the very, very end, we also do breakout room sessions, a uh, session in, in, in networking where there will be a dedicated room for each speaker. So you'll be able to ask even more questions if you couldn't ask in the first place. Uh, this is for the very end. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and pass it to Vincent to uh, introduce himself and, 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 uh, and give the first talk for the night. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen and then start the presentation. Okay, everything should be good now. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. So my name is Vincent. I work for an app called Photoroom. And as Paul just said, I'm talking to you from France. So I'm going to try not to yell too much because it's a bit late and I don't want the neighbors to interrupt my talk. So we are getting pretty close to the new WWDC, but I just want to bring you back to some memories from last year's WWDC. Maybe you remember that last year there was some nice excitement because Apple announced Async await in Swift, but initially it turned out to be one of these things that we are excited about it, but most of us have to wait for two, maybe three or four years in the worst cases before starting to use it. However, fortunately, and something that doesn't happen a lot, but this time it happened, there was a plot twist, we could say six months later, because in December of last year, so at the very end of the year, Apple actually backported uh, the async await mechanism and the Swift uh, concurrency APIs, we could say, by all the way back to iOS 13. So if you were building your app with Xcode like 13.2 uh, and above, you could use the new Swift concurrency even uh, like on iOS 13 and iOS 14. 
So it's something that is pretty rare. And it was actually a very good surprise. And it makes it that, at least from my point of view, now is probably, and by now I mean this year, is probably the best time to start using async await with SwiftUI. Because if your app supports iOS 13 and above, you can now use both. And as you're going to see, they work pretty well together. But before we talk about async await with SwiftUI, I want to start and focus on why was async await added into the language and what is basically the advantage of, uh, of this approach. So first thing, I think we can all agree that asynchronous code is basically the cornerstone of most iOS app, uh, almost all modern iOS app have asynchronous code in their, in, their, in their code base at some point. And of course, the basic example for asynchronous code is making a network call because making a network call is asynchronous by definition. And so if we had looked at uh, how to implement an asynchronous call a few years ago, so a network call, we would have seen that kind of code. So that code uses what's called a completion handler. So it was the approach that we had back from Objective-C where we had blocks and then they got, they got translated to closures in, uh, in Swift. And completion handlers, they've, they've been very popular in the iOS SDK and there are good reasons for it. Of course, there is the legacy reason that they match pretty well the blocks that we had in Objective-C, but um, they also work very well with Swift built-in support of closures. And I'm particularly thinking of the trailing closure syntax. And they're also, Pretty, to, uh, pretty easy to understand for beginners. You just need to understand that this is a function that will be called later, and that's it, you're done. We could say like the, the cognitive load or like the, the learning curve is much easier than for something like Eric Swift or Combine. However, there are also some significant drawbacks with completion handlers that basically made a lot of people a bit critical, not to say very critical, of completion handler. And the big drawback is that composing completion handlers is not a fun experience because if you try to do it with what could be like, could say like the straightforward approach, you're probably going to end up with code like this where you make a first network call. Then instead of completion handler, you call a second network call. You have a second nested completion handler. Then inside, maybe you call a third one, et cetera, et cetera. And that situation is so bad that it doesn't have only one, but several names. So names like callback hell, pyramid of doom. And when you have that kind of name, you know that something is definitely wrong. And it's even worse than that because here I only show the happy path, but it's even worse if you have to deal with errors and even more worse if you have to deal with, for instance, concurrent execution because you need to synchronize your code by hand using something like a dispatch group, which is something that is complicated, uh, error prone, it can deadlock your app. So there were definitely like the need for something better. So how can we deal with asynchronous code in a more, we could say like a scalable manner? There are basically two options. The first option, and it's the road that Swift uh, went down uh, in the first time we could say, which is to use speci specialized libraries. So by special libraries, I mean things like combine Eric Swift, basically reactive, uh, reactive functional programming libraries. And these libraries are going to basically allow us to structure our use of closures. We are still using closures, but we are no longer using raw closures. Rather, we are using closures with operators that have, um, we could say like well-defined behaviors. So it's kind of like going from using go to using for loops and while loops. It's kind of the, the same ID. So for instance, when you use that kind of libraries, you use operators like flat map, which is going to allow you to sequentially make several calls in a better way than by just nesting them. You're also going to have operators like zip that will allow you to run codes in parallel without having to focus on writing all the details of the synchronization. So it's the more declarative approach, closures are still there. We are forcing them to behave, so it's better. But the drawback is that you need to add a lot of extra syntax and it doesn't feel uh, like uh, just Swift code. You had to, to introduce 
new uh, new constructs we could say and it's perfectly normal because it's uh, it's a library uh, and it's basically like as far as you can get when you're using a library meaning that when the code you use doesn't integrate with uh, the swift compiler and the swift language but you can also go down the road of having a built-in language support which is option two and which is the road that async await uh, follows and so before showing how it works in swift i just wanted to show you how so the other guys like tim cook would put it are doing it so this code is code uh, from c sharp and actually c sharp has had async await for quite some time but it's not the only language that uh, that has it for instance uh, javascript also has it and as you can see in c sharp it's possible to mark a function or a method or a method as async and as you can also see when we call other async methods we in a, in such a method we use the await keyword to basically denote that this call site is going to basically be able to pause the execution of our code but what's really nice when you look at this code is that it really feels like normal code and basically it um, it handles asynchronous code uh, but it's still like uh, doesn't show doesn't show up a lot you have the async keyword the away keyword but you don't have like closures you don't have to introduce a lot of new constructs it's like uh, pretty like well managed and it seems like a pretty uh, pretty nice approach so i find it's pretty cool to do it like this but i was definitely not the only one who felt like this because as you now know it's been part of swift so here i've put a screenshot of the swift evolution proposal where the introduction of async await was uh, was pitched and discussed so what's important is that i've put the link at the bottom and uh, if you want to learn more in, if you want to learn in more details uh, the motivation behind the feature and all the little like technical detail i can only encourage you to go check out this uh, this document which is like super interesting to read but for this talk i want to focus more on starting to use async await so first how do we implement the basic use case which is how do we make a network call using async await so if you try to use URL session in a recent version of Xcode, you're going to see that it comes with a lot of new shiny async methods. So for instance, if you want to get data from the network, you can use this method. So you can see the signature. It's the method is called data. It takes two arguments, a URL and a delegate. The method is marked as async. And as you can see, it's going to return its result through the through the return value of the method so we don't we don't have something like a completion handler we are not returning a publisher we just we are just returning the actual value and what's nice is that this syntax enables some pretty cool call sites because i can just create a url like i would do uh, in uh, in uh, any swift code and then if i want to make my network call i just need to mark my call site with a white then i get the result of the network call inside a variable i can fill i can assign to this variable through the return value and then i can keep writing like the next part of my code that are going to be able to use the data and what's nice is that i didn't have to nest anything i didn't have to put anything inside closure this code reads just like synchronous code would the only difference is that the call site has been marked with a weight but actually, if you try to use this code in Xcode and you're targeting iOS 13, you're going to see that there is an error. It's going to tell you that this method is only available in iOS 15 or newer. And I wanted to show you that because it's something that's important to have in mind. It's that what has been backported to iOS 13 is only the async await language feature and the API that really like come with it. So the basically the concurrency module, but all the new async APIs in uh, foundation in Swift UI, they haven't been backported. However, there are people in the community that made uh, wrappers, we could say, that emulate the same API so that we can actually start using it. So for instance, if you want to use async await in AUS 13 today, you're going to want to take a look at, for instance, this module by John Sandel, and it's going to give you the async method to get data from the network, to get uh, to turn a publisher from combine into an async stream, 
and to start uh, an async task from Swift UI. And so now what I want to show you is how we could build a simplified networking and model layer using, uh, using a sync await. So I took the example of using the API from the movie DB. So it's an API that basically returns information about movies, and you can get an API key for, for free. So this is the kind of struct that you can parse from this API. As you can see, I'm interested in movies. I just want to display the title and the overview. And in my response, I'm going to get an array of movies. And of course, I need an API key, but I haven't written it in the slide. If you want to try the code, you need to get your own. But otherwise, the code is going to work. And so this is what um, the method to make the network call would look like. So I'm going to go over it step by step because there are still a lot of uh, information in this slide. So the first thing to look is the signature of the method. So this is, for instance, a method that would be maybe inside a, a service class. So you can see that this method is going to load movies from the network. It takes an argument. Here it's the page of the API that I want to request. And you can see that this method is marked as async. So async, it's a keyword that we can use in the signature of method to indicate that calling this method could create what Swift called, calls a suspend point, meaning that it could stop the execution for some time until the code completes. What's really important to understand is that async, it's part of the signature of the method. Basically, it works just like the froze keyword work. You add it in the signature of the method, and it becomes just part of the signature. And as I was showing you in the previous example, what's very really nice is that the return value of this method is returned through the return value of, no, is that, yeah, the return of the network call is returned through the return value of the method. And we did not need to introduce any kind of abstraction over it. So no completion handler, uh, no publisher, nothing like this. Then inside my method, so I'm going to do a do block because at some point I'm going to want to, um, to decode data from JSON. Then I'm going to compose my URL. So here I'm doing it using string interpolation, but you could basically call any kind of Swift code to compose your URL. And then I'm going to make my network call. So what's important to see here is that first I have to use a wait at the network call because when you call an async method, you need to use a wait. It's basically just like try. It's there to like, um, so that when you read your code, you really see that here, this could potentially create a suspend point. What's nice to see also on this call site is that you can totally uh, like combine having a method that is both async and throwing. Uh, the two can, can work together. There is no problem. So here we have a call site where the method could both return an error. So we have to use try. And since it's async, we have to also use await. What's nice to see is that async method, they can throw an error using a swift throwing mechanism, which was not possible with either like compression handler or with using, uh, or when using combine. Here we can use this mechanism. And so we're going to be able to use the same do block to catch both errors from the network call and from the decoding. And then once network call has returned, so the, the execution will resume and the result of the network call will be available in the variable data. And so we can access this variable in the next part of our code. So we write the next part of our code just on the line below. We are not in a new closure, in a new, like, uh, in a new uh, uh, nesting of code. It's just if we had call a regular synchronous function. So here I create my JSON decoder. I'm going to decode my data. And then it's just straightforward code. So I get the result from the API and I return it. And they have a catch close here. I'm just returning an empty array, but this is where, where you would like uh, be dealing with all the possible errors. So this is the basics of using async away to make a network call. Now let's move on to the part where I talk to you about Swift UI. So I want to build this view in uh, Swift UI. So it's a list. And as you can see, I'm displaying my list of movies I got from my API and I display the title and the overview. So here is the code to display uh, this view. So it's just a basic Swift UI view. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. What's interesting is the question, how do we call load movies in, um, in this view? Because if we were to do 
what was maybe our like go-to approach with combine or with compression learn, which is like to call the method in a closure that we pass to the on appear modifier, we are going to get an error. And this error will say invalid conversion from async function to synchronous function. So the, me the message might be like a bit cryptic, but what it means is basically async function, since they can create a suspend point, you cannot call them from anywhere. You can also call them from other async, uh, async places. And so here, we cannot call this method inside on appear because on appear, it takes just a regular closure. So we could either use the task, uh, create a task so with task with a capital T to launch a task, or we can use SwiftUI built-in modifier that does exactly this. So we're just going to, uh, I am missing something. Oh no, okay, yeah, sorry. So we are going to use the task modifier instead of the on appear modifier. And basically task, it behaves exactly like on appear. The only difference is that the closure you pass into task uh, is async. So you can call other async method inside of it, but otherwise they behave exactly the same way. And just by having written this code, we have now implemented a first Swift UI view that integrates fully with async await. Now let's move on to a more like uh, complex use cases because now I want to implement an infinite scroll for this view. So I want that when I have reached the bottom of the view, I want to make a new network call to load the next page of the API. And we're going to see that with async await, it's actually pretty easy to implement. So this is actually the entire code you need to implement it. So as you can see, it's going to, it fits on a, on a single slide, which is pretty nice. I'm going to highlight the parts that are relevant to the infinite scroll. And so as you can see, I've added a new piece of state in my view to keep track of the current page. Of course, in a real app, you would like maybe to move this into a view model, but I'm putting it in a single view so that we can see everything. And then I just need to use another task modifier in, on every row of my list. And I test, well, is this movie the last movie of the list? And if it is, I just increment the current page and I do a new network call to get the new page of data. I append the result to my array of movies. And by doing this, it's going to implement uh, a working infinite scroll list. And so as you can see, it's really like I find one of the neat features of using async uh, await with SwiftUI is that it's very like declarative and it also really lets you focus on what you want to achieve. And there is a very, very minimum uh, amount of boilerplate. Basically, the only boilerplate is using task and writing a weight. So like it's hard to go like uh, less than this. So for me, like this is really like one of the, the killer uh, use cases for, uh, for the feature. But I still want to show you a few things. Uh, I want to show you also how we can go one step further and implement concurrent calls because you're also going to see that there is a very, very nice declarative low boilerplate API for this. So I want to implement this time a detail screen. And in this detail screen, I want to display first the casting, so the credits of the movie, and then uh, the critics, so the reviews, what people like uh, made of the movie. Did they like it? Did they hate it? Uh, basically like a review. And so since I want to display two different pieces of information, I'm going to make two separate uh, network calls because I need to get my data from two separate endpoints. And let's see how we can make this as efficiently as possible. So here is, once again, the code for what you're seeing on the right. So you can see that, once again, the entire code fits in a side, which is pretty nice. So first, here's the code for the screen. So as you can see, pretty basic. I have a list. I have two sections in my list. First, the credits, then the reviews. And inside, I'm just doing a for each over either the credits or the reviews that are available in my data object. The interesting part is, of course, how do I construct this data object? And so this happens inside the modifier task. So what I'm doing for now is that I'm creating two network calls using the await keyword on two separate lines. So what we see here is already good because we see that when we want to chain uh, calls together, so if we want to implement calls sequentially, 
we can just write them one line after the other. There is no nesting. We don't even need to introduce something like flat map. So it's really like very natural to do sequential, sequential, sequential calls. But we can go even further because here the code, the calls, they are they are called sequentially, even though there is actually no reason to call them sequentially because they, they are using the same arguments. So we could totally run the two codes in parallel. And as it turns out, it's super easy to do because there is a nice syntax that was added to Swift with a sync await, which is the async let syntax. And by doing async let, what we can do is that we can actually create a task that will be started in the background eagerly. And then we use the await keyword when we want to get the result of the task. And so by just writing this code, we started the two tasks in parallel and we synchronized them when we want the two pieces of data using the keyword await. And as you can see, this is much more simpler and much less error prone than writing the same code uh, with a dispatch group. And there is less boilerplate than if you were to write it using, for instance, uh, zip using combine. So for me, asynclet is the second uh, killer use case of, uh, of async await, which is that when the number of tasks that you want to create is uh, statically known at compile time, meaning when you can create one variable per task, you can use this nice syntax and it allows you to create to like save a lot of time because you're creating background tasks, but you're creating them in a very uh, declarative uh, manner. And yeah, so now both calls are happening concurrently. So I see that I'm getting close to the end in terms of timing and perfect because I'm also getting close to the end of my slides. And to conclude, I wanted to talk about the, like maybe like the big elephant is in the room, which is where does combine fit in all of this? Because what I've showed you, showed you uh, implemented with async await, it used to be things that uh, we would have had to use either combine or before that Eric Swift or promise kit to implement. And actually, uh, the answer is not clear cut, but as you're going to see, there is a trend that is like uh, starting to, uh, to unravel, we could say. Uh, the, so first, like just a little like uh, uh, recap on Combine. So Combine, it used to be Apple's first party solution to deal with async code. So Combine was introduced in 2019, if I remember it correctly, at the same time than uh, SwiftUI. And it was basically, Apple's first party equivalent of uh, Eric Swift. However, as we've seen, for simple use case, async await is a much better tool. And by simple use case, I mean the, the kind of asynchronous code where you just need to get one value. You're not processing values over time. You just need to get one value for them. For this kind of simple use cases, async await works better because we could say it's a tool that is more focused on these simpler use cases where uh, Combine is a more broader tool that can handle more complex use cases, but at the price of a slightly more complex syntax. So still a few weeks ago, I would have argued if we'd made it, this talk, for instance, like uh, mid-March, like it was originally planned because I have added this slide since, I would have said that Combine was still the right tool for more complex use cases. But actually, there has been another plot twist because at the end of March, as you can see on March 24th, uh, the Swift team released a new package called async algorithms. And if you check the motivations of this package, it says, async algorithms is a package for algorithms that work with values over time. And maybe this reminds you of something, because if we take a look at combine and what is written on the overview of combine, it says the combine framework provides a declarative Swift API for processing values over time. So we can definitely see that uh, there is a bit of a duplicate that is uh, happening here. So. It seems like the trend is that uh, async await is going to get like uh, better and better because async algorithm, I give it, I give it a look quickly. Like we have all the operators like uh, combine latest, debounce, so all these things that uh, were only in combine before. So like uh, my answer is going to be like uh, wait and see at WWDC if Apple announces something. Uh, maybe they won't take a position, but we will be able to see like what are the 
are they going to use combined or async await in their examples? For instance, will be like uh, very interesting, but it might feel like maybe combine will become just like the underlying engine of Swift UI, but maybe like uh, no longer the, the go-to approach for writing async code. And uh, if it becomes like we could say like uh, redundant because there is a better approach, uh, it's still like uh, a good news for us uh, Swift developers. And that's basically all I wanted to share with you this evening. So before I end, there is a small, uh, small recap with like a few more, a few more links because so I think a wait, uh, what you should like take away from uh, this talk, if you should remember only one thing, is that async await is a language feature to intuitively write and manipulate asynchronous code. And I think intuitively is really the, the key word in this sentence. And there is a good chance that it's going to progressively replace combine for most apps because it's very probable that most apps, they will actually not need the level maybe of like uh, configuration or performance that combine can deliver. Uh, but this talk, it was only really a short introduction on the topic. There is a lot more to learn, like combine and the concurrence topic is really like a, a really like big like a rabbit hole that you have to go down to if you want to understand everything. And I've put the link to a few WC sessions on the topic. So you have the uh, introduction session about async await, how to use async await with URL sessions, exploring structure concurrency, so the async let part and how async await can uh, combine tasks uh, together. Async sequence, which is uh, like the underlying tool to be able to process several values over time with async await. And Swift concurrency, how to update a sample app. So they show you like how to update an app that uses either a compression handler or combine to use the new uh, async await uh, API. If you want to learn more about async await with me, I also have some content. So I put the links to two videos. The first one is about how do you convert code that works with a compression handler to code that exposes an async API. And there is actually a very nice wrapper method that already exists and it's pretty uh, easy to do. And the second one is like about maybe like the third uh, killer use case. It's about actors and more especially main actor. And main actor is basically an uh, annotation that you can add on a type. And once you've added it to your type, Swift, is, the compiler will basically make sure that whenever you interact with the type, you are doing it on the main thread. So it's basically like a thread switching done by you, by the compiler, and to eliminate uh, the old kind of, the old category of bugs where you are manipulating a UI kit or Swift UI object from a background thread. So when you see it like uh, working, you understand why it's uh, like the, the third killer use case of, uh, of async await. And so thank you a lot for your attention. I've put you like two QR codes if you want more content for, for me. So the first one is for my Twitter account. Second one is for my YouTube channel. And by the way, I plan to do a live stream, I think tomorrow uh, to explore the async algorithm package on Twitter. So like if you're curious about it and you want uh, like to see me uh, explore it and comment it, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, you should have a video about it sometime tomorrow. Thank you. I'm doing it for everybody who cannot unmute. Congrats. <laughs> you got like a lot of great comments in the in the chat. I don't know if you got a chance to read, probably not, but uh, everybody like uh, find extremely interesting, obviously. <laughs> to everybody on the room, if you have questions, we're gonna take a few. Um, I, I see one, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it, but you can either raise your hand uh, in Zoom, you have a little in the reactions, you have your raise hand button. We'll unmute you if you want to ask in person. Otherwise, you can write it down and I'll, I'll ask for you. Uh, there is a question from... Yes. So yes. during the yes. infinite scroll, okay. is there a specific reason for the two test blocks or could they have been combined? Uh, so first, let me maybe get back to the slide uh, so that we can have the code in front of us and I can also have the code in front of me. Okay, so it was this slide, if I'm correct. And so could we have combined them? Uh, no, actually we need to put the task modifier uh, on the row because as you can see, I am using, uh, you can see, uh, you cannot see like my, uh, my pointer, but I am using the movie variable and that movie is only available in the closure you pass to the list 
to build the row. So that's why I have put it there. And it's the fact that I have this variable available that makes the if condition uh, super, uh, super easy to write. Anybody else has any question or follow up on this one? If you have any question, don't hesitate. It's a very complex topic, so there are definitely no stupid question. And usually with that kind of topic, if you think you have a stupid question, you probably like uh, have put the finger on a very, very deep topic. We have one question from Michael nice. who raised hand. Uh, Scott, oh, and we can do it. I can admit you, Michael, one second. Uh, okay, you can unmute yourself. Hi, um, I was wondering if you've had a chance to use async await with UIKit at all, and if you've solved some of the, the problems with that, because it's, it's not quite as nice as the Swift UI API here. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not quite, uh, quite as nice. Basically, uh, with UIKit, the way you're going to use it is that you're going to have to create a task. So using the, the, the struct task with a capital T, like inside is there like view did load or uh, view will appear and you will need like to, yeah, to, to, to manage the reference if you want to cancel a task. So uh, it's going to be a little bit less, uh, less plug and play uh, indeed, but still if you need to make like several calls, uh, it can still like be useful. But I would say if you are, if you are using UIKit, most of the value should come from like uh, either like your view model or your presenter, but the part where you are probably like synchronizing, orchestrating several pieces of asynchronous code. And usually like inside your view controller, it will be just like calling maybe like the fetch data, which might be async from your view model, but uh, indeed it will be like less uh, plug and play. But also here, I have put everything in the view in this example, and it's not necessarily something that you want to do. So you can still get some value in UI kit. Um, the big value in UIKit is that if you use the task API, uh, you can uh, basically you have access to main actor, and so you don't have to do like uh, um, switching on the main queue to touch like your UIKit object. I see. I think that's a big like uh, advantage, but indeed it's going to be a bit less plug and play because you don't have the equivalent of the task modifier in uh, in UIKit. All right, we have three more questions. Two in uh, one in person from Jordan. We can start, and then we have two in the chat, and then we'll we'll call it. And if you have more questions, you can stay until the end and uh, the breakout rooms. Um, Jordan, you can go. Hi, thanks for the talk. I think it was very interesting. One question I have is: Is there a way to cancel an asynchronous task? Because like in the old way, you'd get the the task and yeah. be able to call cancel on it. Is there anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, so you can cancel. Uh, basically, to be able to cancel, you need to create the task explicitly. So create it with like the, the task with a capital T, and then you can call cancel on the task uh, handle. Uh, and when you do so, like uh, task cancellation is called uh, is called cooperative, meaning that you ask the task to to cancel, but then the task need to accept. Uh, to uh, to console like uh, itself, and when you need that feature, uh, it's going to require a little bit of boilerplate code. Uh, however, when you like uh, use like asynclet and the task modifier kind of thing, basically like the task you create, they inherit from their parent task, and so when that one cancels, like uh, it's going to uh, it's going to synchronize the task. But uh, it's a bit of a technical topic, and like uh, you, you want to check it out because uh, if I give, if I try to give you an answer, there is one chance of the truth I'm going to say something wrong because like you want to have it uh, like uh, yeah well written. But that reminds me, if some people want to learn about async await, also like uh, the book from Objective.io, like Advanced Swift, they've released a new version uh, very recently. And uh, there is a section about uh, the async await API, which is like super interesting. So like uh, you can get it uh, on the website on Amazon front of paperback, but uh, that's worth the price. Thank you. I'm gonna ask uh, the last three questions uh, from the chat. So we have them in the video, if you don't mind. The first one is from David. Uh, will you think it is valid to still want to learn combine 
or will you go all in with async await? Uh, a, a bit like a UI kit versus uh, Swift UI. I, I would say like prioritize given the kind of job that uh, you are applying to, uh, of course. So like uh, in the short term, knowing about combine might be like a good idea. Uh, but uh, if we think like, uh, like from two to three years, it might be possible that combine will lose in the popularity. But if it's about getting a, a job like tomorrow, uh, yeah, knowing about combine uh, might be like the, the biggest priority. More no, added that, that DC. Some hints from Apple may be coming. <laughs> we'll see. Question from Bill. Are there any other ways that Synco integrates with SwiftUI besides the task modifier? Um, so like the task modifier is the, the way that uh, you, you're going to... So yeah, yeah, that are actually like uh, a lot like uh, the task modifier. It's uh, just to create a, a task, just like on, on Appear, but there are a lot of new modifiers and features of SwiftUI added in iOS 15 that rely on async API. For instance, the refreshable modifier that adds a pool to refresh and takes a closure that is async is a, a good example. Uh, maybe like the searchable API might also uh, like uh, rely on async APIs, but I'm not sure. But at least, uh, yeah, like uh, refreshable modifier in SwiftUI is another like uh, good example. Awesome. And sorry, I skipped one question actually uh, from James. And this is going to be the last one. The rest is going to be, have to wait until uh, breakout rooms. If one of the calls in data equal await, I mean, this one is hard to read, but you can read it, create that cast, review that results. That's what from, from, your, from your slide, I guess. If it fails, uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Let, let me show the slide again. So uh, I think. I think in that case, I, che I cheated a bit because if you remember my method, when there is an error, it returns uh, an empty array. So actually, you can, as you can see, there is no use of try anywhere. So here, the call cannot throw an error. So it's not possible. However, uh, I think like if any of the calls were throwing functions, I would have had to use a try keyword. And then probably like, uh, yeah, an error on one of the two would have indeed made like uh, the generation of the tuple fail. So in that case, it would have like made the tuple fail. And probably if you want like maybe to have a finer uh, way of dealing with uh, the error, it might require like uh, yeah, writing a bit, uh, a bit more code. But here actually that code cannot return uh, an error. Awesome. Okay, I, I say it was the last one, but there's one last, last one. If you can provide any suggestions around unit testing, or maybe you can write in the chat later, since it's the last one. Yeah, part. actually, it, uh, I think so, someone just said it just uh, before. Uh, just like you can, just like you can make a test uh, be uh, throwing uh, method, you can also make a test be uh, async, and so you can just like uh, call your uh, async uh, method inside the. Uh, inside your test. So it's going to be just like testing any other asynchronous code, except that you don't have to deal with things like uh, uh, XC expectation. Uh, so it's like uh, the same, but with less, uh, less boilerplate. Awesome. Again, on behalf of everybody in the room who can't unmute, big round of applause. Thank you very much, Vincent, for this great Thank presentation. You. And uh, without further ado, I will pass it to Scott for the second talk of the night. And we'll see you, Vincent, if you can see, uh, stick around a little bit later to yeah. the, uh, yeah, in the breakout rooms at the end. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Hope it is going well. I uh, know I will jump right into it. So here we go. So with name, so I will introduce myself in a second, but my talk is going to be called No Xcode Project, No Problem. So a little bit about me. So I'm I'm a senior manager here at Capital One. I am the iOS platform guild lead for the servicing platforms, which means I am the people manager and kind of the technical intent driver for all of the iOS work on the servicing platforms platform, which means we cover basically the network and the architecture and the infrastructure of the Capital One application. So my team has helped work on that, the UI components, testing, automation, a lot of different other aspects. I've been at Capital One for about four years, coming up on this month. And as I said, I'm one of the co-organizers of DC iOS, as well as a contributing organizer to the dev community organization, which is kind of the umbrella group for all of our meetup groups. 
I previously presented in April 2020, which was our first virtual meetup. I was supposed to go the month we uh, actually shut down. So I kind of became our test case in giving a virtual meetup. And on the side, I'm a freelance percussionist and drummer. So I play a lot of music on the side. You probably can find me around if you look on various places. I appear in a few videos and albums. And uh, I joked about this last time, but I recently actually converted it home. I used to be mostly an Android user, but I got an M1, I have an iPhone now. So I'm slowly, slowly moving in the uh, direction of the work that I do day to day. And for anyone who caught my last presentations, I had a lot of jokes in that one. I didn't really kind of accomplish that with this one just because the topic is a little bit different and not as many puns played toward it. And there's my Twitter handle. So the next code project. What do you think it is? So obviously here we have our nice little file icon. And you know this is what we see in Xcode on our day-to-day -day basis. And even in Xcode 13, they made it look a lot nicer than it looked in the past. I think even we can remember from some of the older days, the Xcode iconing was not always the best. And so, but this is the nice visual representation on it. But if you look under the hood, it's a bunch of different files, it's a bunch of packages, and it's a giant wall of text. Just like a nib file or a storyboard, anything that's nice and made looking nice to you on the front of the screen kind of looks like a mess under the screen. And especially, it also does not really look nice in GitHub, because as we know, you change one line in one of these multi-text um, text files that really drives the source of an iPhone or a Mac or any sort of Apple product application, you end up with very fun times and nobody is happy. So what can this mean? As I was saying, so GitHub or any other source to source control sees one Xcode project as probably about a collection of 10 different files. And since they're all text files, that means basically our, your entire app is essentially structurally generated as a text file. So when you scale in size, either in terms of number of files, number of projects, or number of developers contributing, it becomes exponentially more and more likely that you will run into merge conflicts as you go on. You'll have to keep rebasing, especially as you add and remove folders, stuff that's common to like the core central, uh, central functionality of an app has changed. And it's not like you can simply get ignored the project because most of the time then your CICD won't work because there's no Xcode project and it's like, Where's the schemes? How do I run this? How do I test this? So unfortunately, you need it in there. Or do you? So this is where the kind of newer terminology and the kind of like some technical innovation has come around with automatically generated Xcode projects. Tooling has come out that has allowed developers to use well-defined types that can help you structure, basically create the structure of an Xcode project and use that to automatically generate your project on, di on, on your disk. Sometimes you can also generate your actually workspace on disk that we'll kind of get into that. Some of these, some of these solutions do allow that, some don't. And then that kind of helps you simplify with a lot of the issues in GIST because then you just have one manifest file that generates all the different files within your Xcode project. And then it means you don't usually have to tweak this manifest file every time files are added or deleted because this manifest just knows to look at the folder as a whole and it can kind of programmatically regenerate itself based on that. Though, as I say, generally, based on your system, an XE workspace file will remain in Git, but you know that's a much smaller footprint. It usually just has a reference to the projects themselves. That means you can kind of get away with leaving that in there because at most, yeah, it's the references of the projects. And if you declare custom headers for your project, you'll find it there. In some ways, actually, Apple has even moved themselves in this direction, especially, I think, with Swift 5.3, 5.4. Before that, when you ever had a Swift package project, you always had to run Swift package generate Xcode project to do that. But now starting around that time frame, you can just double click on the package file. Xcode automatically knows how to read that, parse it, launch Xcode, and you have your project ready to go. So kind of coming into this, we will talk about four different tools that help you generate your project. Xcode gen, Twist, Xcape, and Struct. Predominantly focusing on the first two, and I'll get into that as we get into those. And I'll also kind of give it a quick overview of the Bazel build system, because while it's not a project generator, it does allow you to sidestep the Xcode project in a similar fashion as well. And then I'll also, as we go through this, I'll give a example of an application of this escape. So Xcode Gen, it's probably now known as the most effective standard. 
Uh, it was written, written by Jonas Kolb. It's written all in Swift. It's actually a Swift package. So you can integrate it as a package or as a standalone command line tool. And it's based off of the Xcode project, which I will actually talk about more slightly later. But through Xcode Gen, Xcode project templates are written as YAML. So they're pretty compact, easy to read. And I have an example YAML here. And as you can see, it allows you to say what additional YAMLs you might need under it. Like it allows you to define the options such as your bundle prefix, what packages you need to read from. And it allows you to say, okay, what type of a target are you making? What's the target platform? What's your deployment target? Where's your sources? Do you have any custom settings that don't apply? And then what are your dependencies? And then from, so the pros of using Xcos Gen is that it's a really fast generation uh, because, you know, YAML is a pretty lightweight. There's not a lot of overhead on meeting YAML. Um, it's easy to uh, use multiple templates. It's a common, old, common YAML format. So just because, so it's pretty flexible to drag and drop these templates in the multiple places we use. You can actually link templates from one YAML into a different one by using that include folder. But the cons is that the manifest still isn't as flexible just because you can't kind of go into as granular detail as some other systems. Xcode Gen does not have the most granular support for test plans. Uh, there is some workarounds you have to do to actually integrate test plans right. Uh, it's hard to read errors just because Xcode Gen parser doesn't always cleanly spit it out. Sometimes you need to add custom logic on top of it. And then there's some issues with dependencies. I think of the four we talk about, it's definitely the easiest to use dependencies with. It's relatively easy to integrate CocoaPods and SPM into Xcode Gen. Now, Tuus is kind of the new up and comer in this market. It's created by Pedro Pinera, and it's also written in Swift, and it's also based off of Xcode Prod, which now that I can get into it, is also written by Pedro Pinera and is actually technically considered part of the Tuus organization, though it was. So Pedro Pinera originally wrote Xcode Project. He worked with Jonas Kolb to make the first rounds of Xcode Jam, and then he kind of built Tuist again based off of that. And like Xcode Gen, it is available through SPM as a package, though Tuist's command line tooling is a lot more robust in development. It's intended to be run as a standalone executable rather than be packaged into a custom application, though again, you have the flexibility to do that. With Tuist, the manifests are written in Swift. As you can see here, that it looks very similar to an SPM manifest in some ways, because you know it's just the same structure since it's written in Swift. You define your target, give the properties of the target, and then you just assign it. And unlike Xcode, Xcode it does actually generate you an Xcode XC workspace if requested. So now that the pros of using Tuus is that there's a more active community now. It's definitely getting bigger in scope. There's more, it's more involved and people who are using it are really enjoying it. And it's simpler to use, especially because there's kind of a lot of similarities to how you write SPM manifests and so that there's more of a natural understanding it feels like to use to us. Though the cons are because the manifests are that much more complex to us is significantly slower to generate a project versus Xcogen. And in order to actually kind of step through and debug issues, you have to actually go and attach to the manifest process. So this is just a Swift command line tool, but it's, like Xcode, and it doesn't nice and simply spit out information. So I said, these two are the de facto standards. As you can tell, they're definitely geared more directly towards iOS developers now because they're Swift packages, they're written in Swift. So it's stuff that most iOS developers should be able to read easily and digest easily. Next two projects are a little bit more different. So the first one is Xcake. And like one of my few puns is like, what if CocoaPods generated your entire project? So it was originally written by James Campbell, but I think it sounds like he's kind of given up on the project and handed maintainership over to Igor Makarov. And it's rooted in Ruby. And unlike the previous two, it's a Fastlane plugin, which kind of goes hand in hand with how its source file is set up. So the source is a cake file compared to like the manifest files of Xcogen or 2S. And as you can see, it's actually looks a lot like a CocoaPod pod spec because it's all that Ruby naming nomenclature. If you've ever seen a pod file, you can see some of these, the way these markings are written up are probably similar configurations you would add to your pod file as needed. And as I said, this, I actually found this when researching, like writing a lot of my notes on Xcogen and 2 because Xcogen refers to this as an alternative, but it doesn't seem like 
it's in wide, widely used. It does seem like compared to the other option that I'll go into next, it is a little more used. And obviously, as I think just due to the way it's written and those spec files written, I think people are probably who are using CocoaPods a lot earlier before we had Xcogen into it, it probably was kind of a, something similar and easy to follow into to kind of lead to that project generation before a current tool. And then the last tool is struct, which was also referred to in the Xcogen documentation. It's kind of taking different parts of Xcogen and Xcake. So it's written in Ruby, embedded as a Fastlink plugin like Xcake is. But similar to Xcogen, the template appears to be more as an actual YAML file. And as you can see here, some of the tags look pretty familiar if you look at the Xcogen. But there didn't really be see much user-based discussion about this, and it hasn't been updated when, since 2020. So I assume I added this one as just a note to talk about options that exist, but it seems like it's pretty end of life at this point, probably, especially now that Xcogen and 2S have taken up such larger use, usage shares of usage from developers, and also that they're actually used in relatively big commercial applications. And then kind of the side shot, the side step here is Bazel. And Bazel is not actually a project generator. What it is is an alternate build system. So basically people can use it as an alternative to Xcode build. And since because Bazel is used to build multiple projects, not just iOS projects, it's used by Java, C++, multiple other language. It doesn't really care about Xcode project because it just doesn't care about what iOS and Mac OS developers care about in terms of actual project structure. Instead, what it does, it uses something it calls a workspace file and something called build files. And those basically define what your workspace are, is, what your dependencies are, and how to actually build your files. And then what, what, how this basically expands even further is that Bazel uses a dependency graph to determine what needs to be built directly based on what files were modified and then what can be pulled from either a local or remote cache, speed up that performance by basically saying we don't need to build this. However, this time, due to this, using Xcode and Bazel simultaneously is not that great because it doesn't generate X usable Xcode project files. There are some tools that can help with that. There are plugins such as Tulsi, which is the, at the moment, the official one, because that's also written by Google who owns Bazel and ma maintains Bazel. There's XC Hammer and XCB Build Service Project Proxy, which are plugins that can kind of help you integrate a Bazel environment into Xcode. So that way your developers can be inside Xcode and still build using Bazel and not necessarily using Xcode build. The last one here, Rules Xcode Project, is a new one that was just released to an initial beta, and it seems promising. It might have kind of the strengths of all of these and be able to build even further, but it's, um, but it's still very early in its development life cycle, so we have not quite seen how that will go. And as you can see here, um, the language of their files is something called Starlark, which is basically a extension on top of Python. I will admit I'm not a Bazel expert. I've been learning. I have someone on my team who is our Bazel expert, and I basically expect him to tell me how Bazel works. So let's say you want to go down this path. What's the general flow you do? So there's kind of a few general steps that you take. First, you have to kind of extract your custom specific build settings to your targets. Tuist has a tool to do this. And then there's some other tools such as Build Settings Extractor that can make sure you can basically read your Xcode projects without all your custom build settings into, um, into different types of files. That way you can have them and refer to them. Then what you should do is you should go do an audit and clean up all the files on your disk to make sure that they actually match the folder structure you want. Because obviously Xcode is kind of smart enough to know when you move things around or if you've uh, Simlink some things, or maybe they don't actually live in the folder that's referred to because of how Xcode can um, create the folder references. You might find when you go to generate that, you don't get the project that you expected because some of these files are not sitting in the right place or sitting somewhere completely else. So just make sure that everything has been moved into where you want it and also that everything is named correctly. So it's also, this is also a good time to go and kind of flatten your directory structure when you can. Just, you know, if you have things nested where they don't need to be nested, you can go clean it up. And sometimes it is better to remove spaces from the folder names if it's possible, just because, you know, again, having to deal with escaping the folder spaces and names, it's just sometimes can be a little hard. At this point, you have to kind of go through the long process of iterating and writing your manifest specs and testing and generating until your project actually generates the way you expect it to, your folder structure is right, and your target is building correctly. After that, once you've done, you can go in, you can 
ignore all your Xcode projects and remove them from your repository, and then prop it with some extra speed. So I kind of given an overview, but I think, you know, if we want to hear, we should hear about an example at scale. So I'll talk about how Capital One went through this process over the past, probably started about two years ago and wrapped up about a year ago. I will admit I was not on platform at the time when this happened. I was on a feature team. This was driven by people who have since moved on, but they, a lot of the legwork that they did really helped to kind of navigate us through this effort. So how we started. So as we grew in scale, as and for reference for us at scale is we're at about 200 iOS developers on our main project. So that means we have 200 people committing into the same repository. We probably, on average, can see about 20 to 30 PRs, maybe that's even low end, PRs merge in a day. So obviously, with that at that level of scale, was a lot of movement happening. And if you're working in the same place as a code, modifying the same project structures, you can run into a lot of merge conflicts. And then this especially started as we started moving into more of a feature modular architecture over a monolith, kind of taking some patterns going, looking at stuff like composable architecture, and also just trying to split all of our features and libraries into separate modules so that way we can kind of not have everything just be one giant target. As we started adding more and more of these targets and modules into the Xcode project, especially as we started moving all of these features into into a separate Xcode project, which is just where all of our features for modules lived, we were getting constant conflicts. Because anytime you added a new, basically anytime you added a new target to that, you would there would be conflicts in the schemes, there would be conflicts in the project file. And then if people were modifying other modules at that same time that caused updates to the schemes, there was just a whole host of constantly evolving conflicts. There were a few different options discussed. And after that, the team at the time decided the first process was to incorporate Xcode Gen. At which point, what they did was basically they started writing a YAMLs for the main Xcode project for the feature architecture, as well as each feature module itself had a YAML written. And how we kind of accommodated this was we wrote a custom tool in which we integrated Xcode Gen as a Swift package manager. So now we had a custom command line tooling that would run Xcode Gen, run pod install, and handle any other specific stuff like bundle install, any other custom configurations we need, it would handle it for us. So this works was approved to start at the end of 2019. The first leg of this work merged in early 2020. Unfortunately, this led to something called the interim phase, or as we call it, the dark, dark days of constant merge conflicts. Because we only had part of, part of our project in Xcode Gen, but not the entire workspace and the entire project structure, not everything was generated automatically. So we had one Xcode project that was generated automatically but still three to four that were not yet. And at this time, we couldn't get ignored because not everything was in there. So we still had the automatically generated Xcode project still in our repository. Kind of how we got around this was we, similar to podfile.lock, we had a, for each Xcode project, we had a, had a lock file that basically maintained a current working hash of, ma of the main branch and said, this is the hash. As you've merged in, this is what the hash of the Xcode project should be. And as additional projects were inverted, we had a, we added those hashes to that locked file as well. However, this did mean basically anytime something merged in that in any of those Xcode projects, the lock would be conflicted because the hash no longer matched. And that means basically we were starting to almost for that brief period actually impeding developers because there were just so many merge conflicts. We at least worked to remediate part of that by introducing automatic pooling by saying if the merge conflict was only in the locked file we would automatically resolve the conflict and make sure everything was up to date. So that kind of took some of the onus out of the developers and we let like automated tool we can handle it. As I said, we also had to address, while we did have at this, at that state, we did have to address a workaround for a Cocoa Pods project because we didn't make the Pods Xcode project also automatically generated. We kind of, our workaround was basically we told the pod install to create something we called placeholder pods project. And then from there that just allowed the project to be properly linked. And then we could then pull in the dependencies into Xcode Gen. In the end, it took us about a little over a year to fully convert the app to be fully on Xcode Gen. As I said, we had five total Xcode projects within our workspace. So it was pretty complex. And we probably had well over 200 targets. And that was then. Now we're probably, I'm sure, even over like 300. 
And we also, as we did this, we had to consolidate some of our repos. One of our goals as we've been doing this was to consolidate down from multiple repos into a single repository for all of our iOS code. We are now most of the way there, but as we converted some of these projects to Xcogen, we had no choice but to do it at that time just to make the generation of those projects easier. And then in February 2021, we were able to remove all that code. And now both our local developers as well as our CI CD systems automatically generate our Xcode project through the our Xcode gen tool when it's time to run. Git hooks were created to allow developers, if they wanted to say when they pulled the latest main branch, as well as when they branched between different branches, it would automatically run and invoke Xcogen for them, so they didn't have to think about that. So for us, Xcogen is still a step in our destination. Our end game is to go to Bazel because we do think we are at that level of scale, having, having all the smart dependency tracking and saying we only need to pull build certain parts and pull from a remote cache would be very helpful for the state of our project that it is in. And we know, for example, that Reddit, they posted about this a little while ago. They've done a similar thing at scale. They had gone to Xcogen, and then they used that to kind of move themselves through the process to convert to Bazel now that they are fully on Bazel. So in summary, for projects at scale, being able to generate Xcode projects can be fairly handy. It can help you reduce a lot of merge conflicts. It makes it easy to add new files and structures to an Xcode project. There's multiple different ways you can do that multiple different tools that are widely supported. And it also basically means your source control can hopefully be a little nice and clean. And with that, I can open the floor to questions. So considering the time, I will say if you have any questions, maybe please just join me in the breakout room afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We have time for one or two questions, maybe. If anybody, yeah, we can, if there's any questions, we can take one or two, and then we can move it to the breakout room after that. But yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give a chance for some questions. Thanks a lot. While people are thinking of questions, there was one early on from your intro slide, which was so what was it? What is the difference between? I did see that. And a drummer. So, yeah. So. I mean, I do both, but I mean, you can consider a drummer as someone who plays more just drum set and then percussionist who covers like the classical percussion spectrum. And I do both. Oh, okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to on the video. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can I elaborate more on the Bazel versus Xcojam discussion in prose? So it really, Again, it really comes down to what build system you want to use. So Xcode Gen by itself is still going to have you use Xcode build and Xcode and Xcode build to build everything because all it is is generating your Xcode projects. Bazel itself is a completely different build system. And what it and because basically what it can do is allow you to have caching, more distribution. I'm probably missing a lot of things, and I know my Bazel expert is lurking in the chat, uh, lurking in here. So maybe he can drop some answers in the chat for me on what I'm missing on Bazel. But basically, Bazel kind of allows for the better scaling. They can say, they can say okay, I have 200 targets, but I've only modified code in two of them. I don't need any custom logic to do this. Bazel will know to do this for me. It will just say, okay, I only need to build this one. I can pull in everything else from a local cache or a remote cache and say, okay, I will combine these to make the target and test it. So basically, Xcogen is a way to generate in the current in the current Xcode build world, and you keep using Xcode. Bazel is kind of moving off in a different direction, but there are still some ways to make it play nice with Xcode. Is Bazel the one like big companies like Facebook or Google use? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And another question: Will I end up throwing out all the Xcogen work when you move to Bazel? No. The, with the good, luckily, the good thing is we will not, and that's something Reddit also talked about in their adventure. They were actually able to use a tool then, which allowed them to basically take all the YAMLs they wrote for Xcogen and basically use it to convert everything into Bazel build files. And we are basically looking at something similar ourselves. So it's like we can take all this work from our YAMLs and just be like automatically convert it to the proper Bazel type. So. It, Okay. And one more from David, and then we're going to call it. I uh, have a few announcements, and then we'll go into uh, breakout rooms. Uh, are there downsides, downsides to using Xcogen and the tools versus not? Um, I didn't really get into that. I think the build times are about the same. I mean, obviously, the only thing is you have to factor in time for the generation. But I think compared to the issues, we would deal with not having conflicts in CI CD and 
just some of the nicer organization. I don't think there's that many downsides, but I've not really spent that. I think the only downside is we talked about is like that interim phase can probably get rough, especially if you're at scale. But I think after that, I have not really seen any downsides since we've shifted, especially once we were able to kind of shore up our er error handling and make things a lot nicer. All right, so Rob, finally ask your question and then let's see. Right. <laughs> Which is preferable for migration upgrades or a rollback of the version most package less compatible? Um, I think for us, when we've had upgraded, for example, are you talking about like upgrading Exogen? For example, when we've upgraded Exogen and found an issue, the easy, easiest way was to roll back that version of Exogen. Um, I think generally, otherwise, yeah, I would say in general, probably always the best way is to kind of roll back if you can and figure out what changes you need to make to upgrade to the next version. Awesome. Thank you very much, Scott, for your presentation. It was great. Uh, on behalf of everybody, again, a big round of applause. Um, before we move to breakout room, I have a quick few announcements. Don't worry, it's not going to be too long. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, so can fix it. Yes. All right. Do you see the announcements slide? Yep. You're good. Quick announcements. Yeah, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, it was shared in the, um, I think you shared it, Scott, at the beginning in the chat. Maybe we should can share it again. And that's like community. If you have it like handy, um, the YouTube channel is where you will find, be able to find the, the, the today's talk and, and previous presentations as well, previous, previous meetups recordings. So we definitely encourage anybody who, who wants to watch it again, share it, uh, or, or watch previous meetups to, to check it out. Um, another topic, we are looking for speakers. Believe it or not, we don't have the full year set yet. So if you are yourself interested, if you got inspired by today's presentation and you'd like to share your knowledge, uh, if you're an expert in any domain, um, or if you're just looking to learn about something and you have a topic idea, this link right here and this QR code right here are the same thing. You can take your phone out, write down the link, go in this form. It's only three or four questions. You can submit a talk. I would love to hear from you if you're interested in presenting anything. Or again, if you want to hear about something, please use the form. I'm going to leave it on screen another 10 seconds uh, and probably will share the, the link as well somewhere later in the middle page. But um, whether we are going to continue here and there to do meetups in person, uh, sorry, online or in person in the future in New York City and, 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 and in DC, please let us know. There's no question about whether or not you want to do a remote or in person, but feel free to add it somewhere if uh, you have a preference. Um, and if it's not you and you know someone who is an expert and you think would be a good uh, a person to present, also share it with them. Thank you very much. Uh, one more thing, last year, maybe you were there, we had the WWDC Lightning Talks special between eight and 10 presentations, five minutes long about the WWDC uh, fresh topics that were presented two weeks later, uh, earlier rather. This year, WWDC, I think it's early June, maybe six to the 10th. So we likely have a meetup at the end of the month of June yet to be, uh, you know, obviously scheduled. But same thing, if you would like yourself to present on a quick topic instead of a long 20 minutes presentation, you can use the same form above or reach out to us and uh, we'll happily uh, figure it out. Obviously, we don't know what the topics are going to be yet, so <laughs> you're going to have to figure it out as, as we go, but uh, we, we'll, we'll have more details coming soon. But if you have interest, please reach out. Uh, networking session starting shortly. We'll get into that, but in a nutshell, you have breakout rooms. We'll have two, one per talk for tonight if you want to ask more questions to the speakers of the night. One about hiring, if you're either hiring or looking for a job. You can go in that room and we'll talk. Uh, and if you, I think there will be a general one as well, Scott, a general room for, yeah, for everything else. General one. Uh, we'll ex explain for those of you who want to stick around how, how, to, how to get there. And finally, one more thing, last but not least, uh, it is a New York specific topic on this one, but iOS Soho is going back in person next month, which is extremely exciting. It's been over two years uh, doing online meetups and as much as been great learning through uh, Zoom, uh, the networking person aspect of things uh, and the usually free uh, included pizza and beer are also a great part of the of the of the of the deal, I would say. So thank you very much uh, for to OKCupid okay who is going to host this in New York City. 
uh, next month on May 24th. Uh, Jordan, who is on the call, uh, thank you very much um, for hosting us and looking forward to it for sure. We will try, uh, it's not guaranteed yet, but we'll do our best to try to, to report as well and stream, but we have never done it yet and there may be technical limitations. So can guarantee it. If you're planning to travel to New York, obviously you're very welcome to join. And without further ado, that's it for the announcements. Let's go into networking mode. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to explain how the networking works.